if you look at poaching or the definition of poaching, at least how we apply it in Utah, it's basically anything you take that you don't have a license to take. I think that's really what bothers me. Someone that poaches isn't a true hunter. Uh, the total value for that is just shy of, uh, total value of unlawfully harvested wildlife is just shy of 400000 The number that's truly out there would probably really make us all sick. Hello everyone and welcome back to the eHunter Newscast. I'm your host for this episode, Taryn Hunt. I want to start off by thanking our sponsors, Vortex Optics. Vortex supports us and everything that we do here at eHunter and we're very grateful for them. They have a new rangefinder out. It's the Razer HD 4000 rangefinder. It is unbelievable. Go to vortexoptics.com and check it out. It's so cool. In today's episode, I sit down with Wyatt Buback of the Utah DWR. Wyatt is the captain of law enforcement for the state of Utah. Uh, we talk about the poachings in Utah, specifically the poachings in 2019. We recently did an article on eHunter.com about the total number of animals that were unlawfully killed in 2019. So we chat about that, amongst other things. Um, why it's a great guy, and I really appreciate his time. I hope you guys like this podcast. If you do, please hit that subscribe button. Also, if you would, and if you feel like we deserve it, please give us a five-star rating and leave us a review, whether that be on Apple Podcasts or Podbean or wherever you listen to podcasts, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys and hope you enjoy this podcast. Today I have a special guest from the Utah DWR. Um, his name is Wyatt Buback. Welcome to the call, Wyatt. Hey, how you doing, Tim? Appreciate it. Hey, I'm doing good. Thank you so much for for jumping on uh, this call tonight and, and recording this. Um, I was talking to uh, Kobe and Mike of the Utah DWR, and they mentioned you uh, to talk about the, these items that I want to talk about tonight. And so I appreciate you taking the time with me. Um, I know you guys have a very busy schedule and um, have a lot going on, so really appreciate you, you jumping on. If you wouldn't mind, would you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, name's Wyatt. I was born and raised in Davis County, Utah, um, Layton specifically, and then uh, went to school at Weber State University, played football there for a little bit, played a little bit of baseball, and, and uh, got my degree there. Uh, later went to Utah State University and got a master's degree, but I was a biologist for the Air Force for four or five years before becoming a game warden, and uh, was stationed in Davis County to start and then supervised Davis and Weber County as a sergeant and uh, kind of just been moving up. I'm currently stationed in Salt Lake as their captain, um, kind of overseeing statewide operations now. But uh, a lot of good experiences in Utah as a game warden, both, as, I guess, as a game warden and as just general public. But uh, born and raised here, love it, and don't plan on changing anything. That's, that's awesome. I'm actually a native Utah and myself. I was born and raised down in a small town near St. George, Utah, and and now I live in Colorado, but I miss Utah every day of my life. Um, <laughs> yeah, St. George, most of southern St. George, or southern Utah, is a little too hot for my liking, but there's some <laughs> nice, cool, high mountain spots up there for sure. Do you know Enterprise, Utah? Yeah, I do. So I, my uh, supervisor, at, uh, when I was a biologist for the Air Force, was uh, from Enterprise. So yeah, we have a couple of our officers that are from Enterprise or, or some of the small surrounding communities there, so I'm familiar with it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's that's where I was born and raised, and I mean, it's such a great place for hunting and fishing and just all, thing out, all things outdoors, so... It, no doubt, it's right in the middle of everything there, for sure. Yeah. Hey, quick question, uh, before we jump into the the topic of this podcast so you said that you were a, a biologist um are most of the game wardens in utah biologists i'd say that a majority of them um are just newly graduated college students so i was a biologist through through most of my college career there at weber state um, we have quite a few that do seasonal jobs for the division working with sage grouse or waterfowl or aquatics um, but as for being like a, a full-time employed biologist, uh, there's not a whole lot of our game warden staff that have that experience. Uh, we do have a number of them that have started as game wardens and are now biologists for us um, and have gone that route. But 
Uh, we don't. We have a lot of guys that have biologist experience, but not uh, full-time biologist experience. But gotcha. Well, that's that's a great feather in your cap, though, to have that background and then being a game warden and captain of the the law enforcement yeah. on on top of that. That's a a great advantage for you. Yeah, it surely doesn't hurt for sure. <laughs> I did a podcast with one of the Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Uh, it was the Northwest Regional Manager, and he made a comment that most of the uh, wardens and officers in Colorado are uh, are biologists. So I found that really interesting. But it, it makes sense for you guys to have that background and then to be able to apply that in the law enforcement side of things as well. So, Right. Yeah, you look at some of these other states like Wyoming, they do a, a lot more biology work. They're game wardens. You know, and I'm speculating a little bit here, but let's say they're 50% biologists, 50% game warden. Where in Utah, we're we're probably closer to the 90% law enforcement side of things and 10% biology work. So every state's set up a little bit different. We're definitely a lot heavier on the law enforcement work side than, than for sure Wyoming and likely Colorado. So when they say that they're uh, wardens or biologists, it's probably part of their daily duties um, more so than, than our wardens have to uh, uh, have the opportunity to work in that field. Gotcha. Well, that makes sense. Absolutely. And and you mentioned that some of the officers that live around Enterprise, I knew one of them very well and, and a couple others, and I, I'm pretty sure they weren't biologists, but it makes sense because they were able to focus on the, the law enforcement side of things. So, right. yep. Well, awesome. Well, Wyatt, the, the things that I really want to talk about tonight are um, – are around the poachings that have happened in Utah. Uh, we recently did an article on our website, ehunter.com, about the total number of animals that were illegally killed in 2019 in Utah. And the number that we put on that was 1,050. And we'd gotten that, I believe, from the DWR uh, news press or press releases. And I wanted to talk to you about the validity of that number. Is that a true number for the number of animals illegally killed in Utah last year? Yeah, so I looked at the actual number the other day. It's 1,062 is what we ended up with in, in 2019 for unlawfully harvested animals. So, yeah, that number would be would be accurate for what we have. And does that include all animals, all species? Uh, you know, as hunters, a lot of times our minds go to elk and deer, but is that number including uh, <laughs> turkeys and antelope and everything else? Right, yeah. So it includes uh, fish, non-game species, um, turkeys, prairie dogs, swans, grouse. You know, it includes includes every species of protected wildlife in the state. Gotcha. Okay. And and hunters, you know, there's such a diverse uh, hunting population. Some people just hunt birds. Some people just hunt big game. I would say the majority of our listeners are big game hunters. And so out of that 1,060 animals that were killed illegally do you know the number of deer and elk that were killed illegally yeah there's a uh, hundred just shy of 150 deer uh, 10 of which were trophy trophy deer which we in, in utah we define that in code as a, a deer that's 24 inches or wider and so basically 150 deer and then 100 elk and 14 of those were trophy bulls which is defined as six points or more on one side Wow. And so um, uh, uh, the part that some people, they'll think of poaching or illegally taking animals um, as kind of people that are out there intentionally doing this type of thing. And so if you look at poaching or the definition of poaching, at least how we apply it in Utah, it's basically anything you take that you don't have a license to take. And so that includes the accidental harvest, the guys that self-report and say, hey, I did this accidentally. So it all fa- falls under poaching or illegally killed animals, but there's a, a wide array of intent behind the word poaching, and, and that should be considered in these numbers too. Okay. Uh, and, and that actually kind of brings me to a, a couple of questions that I would have. Um, obviously, as, as law enforcement, you guys um, put out citations for these things. Do you know if the number of citations went up in 2019 versus 2018? So they went down overall, um, if I'm recalling right, I didn't look up any of that stuff, but um, our biologists 
and, and we don't know exactly why that is. Our, our number of illegally taken wildlife, at least the value of that wildlife, went down from average. Um, the number of contacts we had, the number of citations we had went down to some degree from the previous year. Um, our biologists, like you talked to, Covey and, and Mike, have done a great job at trying to alleviate pressure on the mountain and creating other hunts that kind of spread out that pressure. And uh, there may be something to that where deer aren't getting pushed all over or running and people are able to, you know, hunt animals that aren't quite as pressured and it leads to less mistakes. I mean, there, there's any number of reasons why that could happen. But, um, yeah, from, from last year, the numbers are definitely lower um, lower this year, this year being 2019. Yeah, that's a, an interesting contrast there with citation numbers coming down, but yet poaching numbers um, being what they are. So, and that makes sense if if the number of accidentally killed animals, um, things like that, are tied into that number of um, right. illegally killed or killed without a license. Uh, if that all goes right. into it, um, I also want to talk a, a little bit. You mentioned the trophy class deer. Um, we did an article recently about a a trophy deer that was shot. Uh, I think it was near Fillmore or Holden, somewhere in that area. Just an absolute beautiful animal that uh, I just uh, broke my heart to see it. Do you remember that poaching? I don't recall. I, if I would could easily look up the report if I had a, you know, some time to do that. But yeah, I don't recall exactly what case you're talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's okay. I mean, not something to not a rabbit rabbit hole that we have to jump in to sure. at this point. Maybe we can do that on a on a later date, but. Um, I just thought that was crazy, and you know the thing about poaching, it it, it kind of gets my blood pumping a little bit because, and then I may go on a little bit of a rant here, but um, you know, I I don't think the true hunters would be out there poaching, and I think that's really what bothers me. Someone that poaches isn't a true hunter, and I see animals like that one um, that was taken. He, I can't remember how big he was, but just an absolute beautiful, beautiful mule deer. And not that I hunt that area, but I have family members that do. And, you know, they'll never have a shot at that, at that trophy animal. Um, it just, it, it, like I said, it makes my, my blood boil when I, when I see those animals that are taking e- illegally, especially when they're at that trophy class. Um, you mentioned sure. elk. Can you tell me a little bit about where those elk were taken illegally? Yeah, they'll be taken all over the state. Um, the southern region seems to have, every region, will, we have five regions in the state, the northern, central, southern, southeastern, and northeastern. And every single one of those is going to have trophy bulls that are that are being harvested. Generally speaking about cases, uh, the southern region seems to have more than their fair share of stuff down there, largely deer cases, but, but they have plenty of elk cases also. So uh, in the central region, has a lot of elk cases too so it's uh it's going to be dispersed throughout the state um i don't know that one locale is going to have drastically more numbers than any other but uh um yeah i'm not going to be able to provide a specific answer on that one just because it's everywhere gotcha and actually that's that's a great answer to know if it's really statewide you know kind of even across the state that's that is good to know um in regards to these animals that are being taken, uh, I know that the fish and game, fish and wildlife, they usually put a monetary value to each animal that's taken. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so you sure. mentioned 100 elk and a 150 deer. Is that correct that were taken? Yep. You, so what's the monetary value on those animals for the DWR? So for the an elk that's not a trophy, it's $750. For a trophy elk, it's eight grand. For a, a non-trophy deer, um, I believe that's four hundred dollars. I'll check that real quick. Yeah, four hundred dollars, and for a trophy deer is eight grand also. And so for those ten trophy bucks, that's that's uh, eighty thousand dollars. And then you have uh, almost six or uh, hundred hundred twenty thousand dollars for those trophy elk. Hundred twenty thousand, I should say. Wow, that is, <laughs> I'd mentioned that it makes my blood boil when I th- talk about poaching. Yeah. And this this is going to make it even worse. This is supposed to be a clean podcast. I might have to, <laughs> to bleep out a few <laughs> things on this one. <laughs> Where does the DWR, oh, sorry, go ahead. 
Nope, I was just going to say, if we're talking value of wildlife, or at least the value placed on it by by state law, you look at the bighorn sheep. A bighorn sheep uh, is valued at thirty grand. Um, so if you poach one of those or, or poach two of those, uh, you're looking upwards, you know, thirty, sixty thousand dollars in restitution for that animal. So what? I've got so many questions going on in my head right now. So when you guys if you apprehend someone that has poached, um, does the fee or fine that they receive reflect those numbers? Yeah, for the most part. The courts can kind of change it to whatever they want. Um, but when we say say we investigate a, a, the unlawful taking of a, of a trophy bull elk, uh, we'll basically put that report together. In Utah, that's a third-degree felony, or at least will be uh, presented to the county attorneys as a third-degree felony. We present the facts of the case to them. They look it over, and they ultimately make a decision on what they want to do. And and with that um, report that we turn over, there's a, a recommended minimum amount, and for a trophy elk, that's eight grand. And so, county c- attorney can charge more than eight grand. Sometimes they'll they'll reduce it from eight grand, but that will be the number that we recommend be paid for someone that intentionally went out and poached some uh, a trophy bull. Gotcha. Okay. And do you know the number on other animals, like say say an antelope or a turkey, do you know what the the monetary value is placed on them? Yeah, turkey is a hundred bucks and then a uh pronghorn antelope is four hundred bucks. Okay. And I... so we had uh let's see, we had seventeen pronghorn, which is long higher than we normally have. We had some bear issues this year too. And then uh Turkey, we had 23 unlawfully harvested turkeys in 2019. Wow, that's amazing. And I just kind of want to put out that out there for our listeners just so they can kind of get a, an idea for what the DWR puts on on each right. animal. Where does the DWR, or where do you all come up with that value, do you know? That's set in state law. And so uh, the legislation in, in Utah is sat down um, likely in concert with the Division of Wildlife and came up with a monetary recommended value for these, for each species of wildlife. Sometimes they're grouped into like, you know, fish or trophy fish or non-game animals. They don't have it for every single species that's protected. But uh, yeah, that's all done through legislation and state law. Okay. Makes sense. Absolutely. Well, and you know, that monetary impact, it affects, it affects so many things, you know, I mean, us as hunters and fishermen and sportsmen, sportswomen, you know, we, we provide a lot of funds to um, the fishing game and, and wildlife and, and all of that. And so seeing these numbers that are taken away and then you look at the monetary value, I mean, for a total of 1,060 animals that were taken illegally or without a permit, you know, you, you put that mo- that money back into the, the division's pockets, man, there's a lot of stuff that you could do with that money. I'm sure. And, and right. taking that opportunity away from us as hunters, um, like I said, I've been a, I, I was born and raised in Utah and I've been building um, points to hunt Utah, um, really specifically in elk and in, uh, in you know, bighorn sheep and so desert bighorns. Mm-hmm. And just the thought of these animals being taken illegally and the impact that that may not directly, but indirectly have on me ever getting one of those licenses. It, it, it really, like I said, it really breaks my heart to, to see those. Um, my next question would be, and we talked about it with site, what the citations have done year over year, but with that number of 1,060, is that more or less than years past? That That's pretty common. Um, in the last, in the last five years, it's been as high as about 1,300 and as low as about 900. So that, that 1,000, 1,100, uh, that's right in the ballpark of what we typically see every year. Uh, the total value for that's just shy of uh, total value of unlawfully harvested wildlife is just shy of four hundred thousand for two thousand nineteen, and usually we're about half a million to, to five hundred fifty thousand is is pretty average. So the actual value of post wildlife, while the number is fairly consistent, it's uh, it was a little lower last year too, which basically just means we had less of the big animals. But you get a one bighorn sheep poached and that raises that number quite a bit with that thirty thousand dollar value but have did you have many of those once in a lifetime so bighorn sheep uh 
mountain goat moose. Did you have many of those poached in 2019? So we had uh, seven bison, with one of them being a trophy, which is basically just a bull. Any bull would be considered a trophy bison. And then uh, five moose, with one of those being a, a trophy bull. But in Utah, a trophy bull for moose is a, a moose with one antler that's more than five inches. So really any bull in Utah is going to be a trophy. But uh, So that would be 12, 12 once-in-a-lifetime species we've had. No bighorn sheep, uh, although we have had multiple of those over the past handful of years. Wow. I a, lot cannot... of those are, a lot of those illegal bighorn sheep come from residency issues where people are trying to to apply as a non-resident when they are a resident to help draw tags or vice versa, whichever the case may be, um, because sometimes it's, it's easier for a non-resident to draw a tag depending on permits in a unit and things like that. So you'll get people that try to play the system, and that's largely when those bighorn sheep issues come into play because those tags are so hard to get in Utah. It... Is that the same with the bison? Because I just cannot imagine anybody trying to poach a bison and get away with it. <laughs> yeah, bison, generally speaking, uh, we, we do have some illegal intentional harvest of bison, but generally speaking, we have uh, any sex hunts where a hunter can go kill a cow or a bull, and then we have some cow-only hunts. And when when someone that hasn't hunted a bison much or hasn't been around bison very much is trying to decipher a, a cow from a bull or a cow from a young bull, um, it seems like a fair portion of those unlawfully harvested bison are accidental by misidentification of sex. Or they'll shoot one and the herd runs off and they shoot and hit another one and then two end up tipping over, those types of things. Uh, bison tend to be one that's more accidentally shot through lack of experience or, or potential carelessness than, than most other species. Moose would fall in that same category for what, whatever reason they get misidentified as as elk or whatever from time to time and and unlawful ho- moose harvest by accident is is fairly common also that is interesting I, I, oh man yeah just the thought of someone trying to you know really actually try to illegally kill one illegally poach one and try to to right. take care of it and get it out of <laughs> yeah. there before someone caught them that's it's not yeah, it's not an animal you're thrown into the back of a truck real quick to get out of there. There's no doubt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love this because when we when that article came out on our site about the 1,050 animals that were illegally killed, I think a lot of us as hunters, our mind went straight to that poaching. You know, they somebody purposefully poached that animal, and so it's right. nice to know that. And I like how you were unlawfully killed. Um, that's that's so much better a better way of saying it that the they weren't all poached the way that a lot of us right, hunters yeah. think. Yeah, that that word poach has a pretty strong stigma tied to it, where people will say, "Well, I did I did kill it illegally, but I didn't poach it." They, they really mean the same thing um, when you boil it down. But uh, there's there's like I said, different levels of of poaching, and and when it comes down to it, it's just an illegally taken animal, like. You. Yeah, there's purposeful and then there's accidental and, you know, accidents happen, you know, stuff happens. And I, I think most of us as hunters and sportsmen understand that, you know, like you said, you shoot one, the herd takes off, you think you're shooting at the same one and you walk up there and you've got two laying there. Um, I think most hunters walk up to that situation and get very sick to their stomach and which is (laughs) okay. So Um, we uh, talk to hunter ed classes a lot about that type of stuff and there ain't a person in the world that wants to call and turn themselves in but we base a lot of our decisions on on what we do in those situations based on what the person did afterwards i mean uh, you have license suspensions that are tied to a lot of these if you do so intentionally and things like that and if you take the time to call us and say hey I, i made a mistake then then you rarely if ever or facing those license suspensions um, because obviously we can tell you didn't mean to initially or, or, or most of the time that's the case. And the severity of what you might be punished with goes goes down quite a bit most of the time. But if you try to hide it and we end up finding out about it, um, which happens quite often, then the punishments are a lot more severe for, for you knowing you did that and then not taking the right steps to make it make it right. So if you call in, is there usually going to call in and you admit to it and, and explain what had happened and really try to be repentant about it, there's still going to be a fine attached to that, though, isn't there? 
Uh, there could or could not be. Uh, we'll investigate it just like we would any other crime. And I can give you some examples, good examples of um, situations where, where nothing was done. Um, so we'll go look at it as if it's a crime. And, and there are certain situations like, you know, did you run into 10 people that said they were going to call you, you know, report you as you're hiking out? And so that's the reason you called versus there's nobody around for 100 miles and you called yourself in anyways. But the example I, I always tell people, um, uh, we had a hunter up above Davis County here that snuck up on a on a herd of cows as a cow elk hunt, um, shot at a herd while they were laying down. They stood up and they all ran off. And uh, he walked over there and looked for 45 minutes for any blood, didn't find any blood at all. And, and Have you ever been up to the Davis County area? I have, yeah. Yeah, so that mountain's super, super steep. I yeah. love hunting it for that reason. But It's a uh, great cow hunting space. He didn't want to hike all the way. What's that? I said it's a great cow hunting space for sure. <laughs> right, yeah. So he didn't want to go back down and, and have to hike up the next day, and he fig- figured he knew where those elk went. Um, there's nothing illegal about shooting at, missing an animal, and then, and then harvesting one later. So he hiked up the mountain, found the herd again, killed the cow, and he's packing that cow down, and as he's packing it off the mountain, he runs into a a freshly killed cow, which was the first cow that he actually shot at. They'd never found any blood for it. Oh. So he sat down and, and called us and says, Hey, I'm, I'm in this situation. What do you want me to do? And we had him clean both animals. And uh, so it didn't go to waste. And we said, we'll meet you first thing in the morning. Cause it's after dark at this point. And uh, he walked us back up the next morning. says, this is where I shot from. This is where they were. And he packed down a, I mean, a 50 yard by 50 yard square, like every inch had a footprint in it looking for blood. And uh, we found the cow went 200 yards. We found two little tiny drops of blood. And uh, it, obviously, if you've if you've tracked big game, two tiny drops of blood over 200 yards is going to be next to impossible to find. But so uh, we ended up giving him a warning for that because he truly did everything he possibly could to recover the animal, and uh, just couldn't find it. Had he not called us, there's another group of hunters on the other ridge that watched the whole thing, and so. By the time that the hunter who violated called us, the other hunters had already hiked down, got his license plate. We knew the suspect's name, where he lived, his phone number, where he worked. And so if he had tried to get away with it, we would have would have caught him anyways. But, uh, you know, he would, would have had license suspensions and big fines to face there. But um, he did the right thing. He put in all the effort we'd expect our hunter to do. And uh, in that particular case, he got a warning. So there's not always going to be a fine tied to it. We'll just look at all the facts and, and make the best and most fair decision from that. That makes sense. Um, I, I knew a story mm-hmm. of a, a guy that had shot, he shot at a deer, hit the deer. Um, and when he walked up there, there were two laying there. He had shot the, there were two, there was a deer standing right in front of the other one, <laughs> had no idea that the right. one was behind it. Um, sure. Shot both. Um, he didn't get a, well, he did. He, I think he did get a fine, but he didn't get a license suspension for it. But I think he got the fine right. because he should have been more aware of of the surroundings of the animal and taking the time to really look. And so, it made sense that he. And it wasn't a large fine. It was a. It was a fairly small fine. But so yeah. we're yeah. so word to the wise is what what you're saying is, if if some a situation happens, uh, the best thing that you can do is reach out to you guys as soon as possible and and just be truthful and honest. Yeah, exactly. There's there's very few places where you're not going to have someone potentially around you watching. So just, you know, act, act as if someone's always watching you do the right thing and, and it, it'll turn out for the best in the end. That's a great segue to my next point and question that I mm-hmm. want to talk about. And as hunters, you know, we don't sit on our hands very well. We always want to be doing something. We're always you know, getting into the biologist way of life and we're always just putting our noses into everything. Um, but is there something that we as hunters and sportsmen and outdoorsmen, is there something that we can do to help you all to, to lower these numbers? The, the main thing, there, there's a handful of things that, that you can do just to prevent the accidental stuff, knowing the laws, regulations, um, being careful when you or attempting to harvest an animal, especially cow elk in Utah. It seems like we have a, a bigger issue with accidental harvest of cow elk than, than we do most other species. But it, at the end of the day, the, the thing that hunters can do the, the most for us that would help us the most is just 
help us see our eyes and ears. In, in Utah, an average officer covers 2,000 square miles, oh. uh, and that's an average. We, ha- we have some officers that can drive 100 miles an hour for two and a half hours and barely get from the north end to the south end of their districts, and that's not counting going east and west. And so our areas are huge. Uh, we can't be everywhere at once. Uh, a number of our big, big cases come from it's, it's uh, the UTIP line, Utah, turn in a poacher hotline, um, and it's purely concerned citizens, involved hunters, passionate hunters uh, that see or hear of something that's concerning to them that, that they turn over to us and, and let us run with. Uh, a, a huge portion of our big, big cases come from that tip line. And so be our eyes and ears, help us gather information, let us know about stuff that you're seeing out there that's illegal. Um, anytime those calls come in, they uh, we have to do a report. It will be investigated. Some people won't call because they're like, oh, an officer's never going to actually look at this. I, I can guarantee you an officer will, will look at every single call that comes in. Um, but we can't look at stuff we don't know about. So uh, that that hotline's on the website. It's on every license in Utah that you'll ever buy. It's on our trucks. It's in all of our guidebooks. Um, so if, if you have a wildlife violation that you know about, let us know about it because, like I said, we got huge areas. Uh, we, we can't do it without the public. Well, thank you. And I, I think a lot of hunters worry that, you know, they worry about being snitches. And I, I shouldn't even say a lot of hunters. I'm sure some of the hunters think, sure. oh, I don't want to be a snitch. I don't want to tell on somebody. <laughs> but really, at the end of the day, um, you've got to have your moral compass in the right place. And you've you got to know that reporting something like that is the, the better thing to do in those situations. And so, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Right, like, yeah, it's. No, no. I was just gonna say, yeah, you, you're 100 percent right. It's 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 essential and critical if we're gonna really put a dent in this these poaching activities. But we work with confidential informants all the time. If you want to remain anonymous, that's nothing new to us. We'd we'd rather have you remain anonymous and and potentially lose a case to make sure that that we honor your wishes um, than than burn in a, a valuable witness for us. And so. If you want to remain anonymous, we make hundreds of cases a year with anonymous tips, and so we can work with you there. If if the worry about being found out is a concern, yeah, I'm hoping that the majority of my listeners, our listeners, are, aren't that way. Hopefully, the most of them, if they see something, that that they report it. But and going back to your first point as well, making sure you know the regulations, making sure like you you talked about. Um, seeing a I guess was it they were you said that a lot of people are hunting moose but they kill an elk or were you saying something along those lines yeah it seems like the unlawful moose harvest is fairly regularly elk hunters that that misidentify we have a lot of uh, non-residents from from back east and not saying back east hunters in the slightest are, are not familiar with western hunting because many many of them are and we have issues with in-state hunters that just aren't that experienced, but, um, we, we get those populations that are new hunters that, that have never been elk hunting, um, never seen a moose. And so when they see something that big in elk habitat, um, Uh they get a little excited and, and jump the gun a little bit before really identifying what they're shooting at. And so, uh, unlawful moose harvest during the elk hunt is fairly regular for us. It's a common occurrence. So I'll put that plug out there. Just make sure you know what you're hunting and what it looks like. Right. I mean, jump on YouTube. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> YouTube yeah, videos exactly. can show you exactly. Do a little bit of research. Yeah, we've had moose shot at deer, which obviously that size difference is, is mm-hmm. enormous. But, but uh, yeah, just, just got to be careful. It's, it, we, we want new hunters to be out there for sure. We wanted to get them involved. Uh, just try to do as much homework as you can before you get started. Get with someone that knows that stuff or call the division office and any of our officers would be happy to, to help you out, throw some information your way to help you be safe and legal on your hunt. And we appreciate that. And I think that goes for everybody. Reach out, ask questions. Now, I have learned, moving to a new state, moving from Utah to Colorado, I have learned the value of reaching out to um, game wardens, officers. And I, I don't think I've been on a hunt in Colorado yet that I haven't stopped an officer and just asked him questions because there's a lot of stuff I don't know. And there, like you said, there's a lot of people that do come from back east to hunt, not saying anything about, about them, but 
you know, different regulations, different species, things, you know, it's, it's a right. completely different world of hunting out West than it is out East. And so, yeah, I, I value the, the information that you can get from a, a an officer, a game warden, a, a biologist. So definitely reach out. Um, Wyatt, I got one more question for you and I'll, and then I'll let you get out of here. Um, but the question I had is, is the DWR, are you guys doing anything specifically to, to lower these numbers? Are you changing management plans to lower the poaching numbers? Are there any um, projects that you guys are doing to help lower those? So a lot of, the, it, like I said at the start, some of the, the hunts that our biologists are thinking up to kind of alleviate the the pressure on the mountain may or may not be, you know, may have an indirect effect on, you know, what we saw this past year with lower numbers. So time will tell if if those numbers stay low. Uh, maybe that's a factor. But uh, we're always doing public outreach, still um, public education, trying to educate hunters. We we have an app, um, a cell phone app that um, has received tons of awards nationwide for for innovations on those fronts. That have guidebooks at, at everybody's fingertips now. Um, all through that, so outreach has been a, a huge factor for us. Um, some of the new reporting systems that we're looking into, I talked about the UTIP hotline that people can call when there's violations. We have email hotlines set up also, and now we're looking into text hotlines. What, whatever we can do to make it easier for the public to report violations they're seeing is, is what we want because, uh, like I said, we can't do can't do anything w- without, I shouldn't say anything, but, but the public helps us a ton with these cases, and so if we can make their ability to contact our officers that much easier. Uh, we're definitely looking into that. Um, we give reward permits, reward monies for people that turn in poachers. Um, have to meet certain criteria to get that. Most of it's not very hard. The permits are a little bit tougher to get, but the monies are, we give out reward monies fairly fairly regularly for people assisting us with poaching cases. And then uh, the last thing, we, we haven't made any cases from this we haven't really got a whole bunch of data from it yet because it's still new is we have a what we call utah migration initiative going on which is basically we've we've collared hundreds and hundreds of different species uh, not hundreds of different species but hundreds of animals of variety of species uh, cougars and bears uh, elk and deer and, and tracking their migration patterns and seeing where they go um, when they when they die, when they get off a mortality tone, our biologists are going and picking up those collars and and if able identifying kind of what um, what possibly killed that animal. And so if we we can start getting poaching data from that um, as more of these collars are recovered and our biologists go look at these things to see maybe we have poaching concerns in areas that we're we're not even aware of, or, or maybe we can better identify how frequent poaching is actually occurring um, that we didn't know about before and so that that will be interesting data to, to to use here in about uh five ten years when when we have several several thousand um collar records on different species so uh there there was a i'll probably get myself into a little bit of a rabbit hole here but i think it's a valuable point there's a study that oregon did i think I think it was Oregon that they collared a couple hundred uh, deer, bucks, and does in a specific area, and when they when they died, they'd go investigate the cause of death. and And in that study, four percent of all the collared deer that um, died and were investigated were from poaching. And so, if you look at basically, if you consider that collared group of deer as as an entire deer population, four percent of populations being poached, at least in that survey. Um, if you apply that to Utah, Utah's in the last couple of years has been right around 380,000 deer in the state. And if you consider 4% of those are being poached, that's 15,000 deer a year uh, that are being poached. And, and like I said, we know about 150 of those. Oh. And so if you, if you consider what poaching could, could possibly go on um, versus what we actually know about, I, I I believe that the number of poaching cases that are actually occurring versus what we know about is hugely skewed toward the direction of the ones we don't know about. And, and I don't know much about the area that that survey was done in. Most of Utah is pretty rural, may not be as accessible as that deer population in that study, but 
but nonetheless, I think it gives us a pretty strong indication of of the abuse that could potentially occur on a landscape with a given species if if we don't have hunters that are willing to willing to turn in poaching when they see it, it, it because the more they get away with it, the more the more bold they become, and then the problem just just increases. So if that study has any indication of what's going on in Utah, uh, we need some help from the public for sure. And that's the sad truth behind it is, I mean, that even that number that we know about, that that's a large number, but just like you, you right. just said, that the number that's truly out there would probably really make us all sick. And so, so right. yeah, anything. And I love that you guys are doing incentive programs. In fact, I, you mentioned some of those permits that you guys give out reward permits uh what mm -hmm. per, what permits are those are they usually like general deer permits or or what are they do you know so so historically they've been limited to kind of our limited entry units which which you're familiar with because you're you're getting points for them but yeah. for those of you that are listening to this podcast limited entry units are are units that um take a fair amount of time to draw for example i'm at 19 points for elk trying to draw my limited elk uh, limited elk permit. Um, so they're, they're basically units that we manage for uh, older age class of animals. And so historically, uh, it had to be a, a poached animal on a limited entry permit that you turned into us that we got successful prosecution on and you played a vital role in getting that prosecution. That would qualify you for or potentially qualify you for a permit for that unit for the following year. So uh, the Henry Mountains in Utah is, is definitely the best place to kill a big mule deer, probably top three in the nation, I would guess. Um, takes about, if you had zero points and started applying out, it, unless you get lucky, we run a bonus point system here in Utah that I, I won't explain, but um, unless you get lucky, it's probably going to take you 30, 40, 50 years to draw that tag, where if you see someone poach a deer there, um, you help us investigate that, help us prosecute that individual um, you can get a permit for the Henry Mountains for the following year. Uh, but recently we've expanded that program. It, it does include general season deer permits now. Um, it includes a whole bunch of different species that it hasn't before. And so that that, that uh, reward permit program has expanded drastically in the last, last two years. Wow. Well, that speaks volumes because I'm actually in the same boat you are. I have 19 elk points in Utah trying to draw that limited entry, and I feel like I've been doing it for a lifetime. And you're right. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you're uh, if you want to draw a Henry Mountains tag in Utah, uh, I hate to say good luck, because <laughs> but but good luck. Yep. It's it's going to be a long time yep. that you're going to be waiting and <laughs> building those points. So. Boy, if that's not incentive enough to to turn in someone that illegally kills an animal, my goodness, I don't know what is, because that would save you right. a lot of time and and money. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll ask you off the air what unit you're putting into elk, and we'll see if we're competing for the same tags here. But, I know. Uh, what? Yeah, those, <laughs> those big elk tags are are almost once in a lifetime tags now. So they they really are. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, you really truly feel like you've been putting in for a lifetime for them and yep. like I'm, I almost want to get the tag just to to get the hunt over with because i've been waiting i feel like <laughs> so long to do it are there yeah, my, my old man oh go ahead Sorry. i was just gonna say real quickly are there any of the once in a lifetime hunts that are in that reward program yeah all of them are gonna be as far as i'm aware with that new rule change oh wow so, wow that's amazing what were you gonna say yeah, about your old man uh just he he drew his uh, limited elk tag after 20 years and there's a certain level of stress that runs into those tags after waiting that long that makes it to some degree challenging to really have fun on it because you know you've waited that long to kill a, a trophy animal and, and you don't want to go home empty handed but you want to go home with something that's worth waiting 20 years for and so there's an element of stress that I didn't much care for when, when I was helping him fill that tag but uh, we ended up doing pretty well and uh super happy with what we got but uh, it's it's different than a general season tag that you can get every year or every other year there's just uh, a lot more stress involved yeah sadly at least was for me sadly i'm you know i, I hunt here in colorado now every year because as a resident i can draw a lot of these tags with zero points and 
yeah, those right. tags, I have no stress, and we just have a good time. And I'm afraid right. of, when I draw that <laughs> limited entry tag, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be sweating bullets every day that I, I don't have blood on my hands. So, <laughs> so uh, I agree. Yeah, we we spent we killed ours on the 11th day. We were down there. It's a 10 day season, but we went down four days before to get some extra scouting in. And so, you know, after after nine, ten, eleven days in the field, your brain's fried, your body's fried, and you're just hoping hoping it turns out well, but but yeah, there's. A, if, you, if you, whenever you draw that tag, give our officers a call. They they know their areas very well and can point you in the right direction. Absolutely. Well, and like I said, if man, if that's not incentive enough for someone to turn in someone that illegally takes an animal, I don't right. know what is because there, it's hard to put a a price tag value on that. That's a that's a yeah. gift beyond a gift. <laughs> yeah, it is definitely priceless in most instances for sure. Absolutely. Well, Wyatt, I appreciate you jumping on and answering these questions for me. This puts this sheds a lot more light on that article that we did. Um, it really makes a lot more sense to us now, and I hope for my listeners as well that they they understand the the background of that number. And and like I said, we 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 know in our hearts that it's it's a lot more than that number. Um, but we just need to do all that we can as hunters and sportsmen and sportswomen to to be out there and and be the eyes for you guys so so i appreciate your time why i really do uh, appreciate what you guys do at the utah dwr um and please share that appreciation to to all of your officers and wardens uh, i will for sure and appreciate the support from guys like you it uh, goes a long ways without a doubt thank you well i'll let you back to your night uh hopefully we are able to chat again soon but again appreciate your time My pleasure. Don't ever hesitate to call. If you need anything from us, let us know. I won't. Thanks, Ben. All right. Thanks, buddy. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. If you like this episode, please share it with someone that you feel would enjoy it as well. And make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. That way, when we release new episodes, you get notified immediately. Thank you all.